everybody. This is Captain Fred, your host for Aviation Theater and a proud member of the San Diego Aerospace Museum, the first place to visit when you come to San Diego. We have a good program for you today, and we'll get started right after this important message. once again to Captain Fred's Aviation Theater. Today we're visiting with Mike McRae and his AT-6 airplane. Mike, welcome to Aviation Theater. Welcome, Fred. Thank you. Thanks for bringing your beautifully restored airplane here today. Thank you very much. Um, this was a trainer, but before this one, would you tell our viewers just a little bit about the Stearman and the N3N, which this airplane replaced? This actually is a Navy SNJ-5, which was the Navy's version of the uh, AT-6. Um, the students, would, the primary students, would start off in an N3 in Navy at Pensacola. It was a biplane with a, I believe it was a 300 horsepower Jacobs engine in it. A very slow aircraft, but a very a docile aircraft that they could they could get their basics in. They would then be advanced to the uh, SNJ-5 here, which was a a uh, more complex aircraft. It had retractable gear. It had a 600 horsepower engine. Had a service ceiling of 22,000 feet and could actually simulate any of the activities the Navy wished that their pilots to experience. It could be used as a carrier qualification aircraft, an instrument aircraft, uh, an advanced trainer, and an advancement aircraft into more complex the F4U, the, uh, the, the Wildcats, the Hellcats, the, the, the fighter planes of the era. Now if somebody said to you, in World War II, I flew AT-6s, SNJs and Harvards, you would laugh. Would you tell our viewers why? Well, the Harvard was the Canadian version of the aircraft. The uh, the AT-6 was the Air, the Air Force's version, and of course the SNJ was the the Navy's version. And you would have to be in all three branches of the service, <laughs> or an awfully busy person, to to do that. But the AT-6, the SNJ, and the Harvard's all the same airplane. The Harvard was an, unar an unarmed aircraft and had no wheel pants because of the snow involved in, in the northern air airports. Uh, this aircraft had 330 caliber machine guns on it. Was used as a as a basic combat trainer. And and had bomb racks on it as well. Okay. Let's talk about the engine. The uh the N3N and the Stearman had, uh, what, 300, 400 horsepower? The Stearman came in a 220 and a 225 horsepower version, and I, I'm not really sure about the N3Ns, but I think it was a 300 horse like. Some of my friends will shoot me for saying that if it's the wrong engine, but I think it was it was so, something similar to that. And when they, they went into this, this was, what did you say? Basically a 600 horsepower engine. 600, so almost triple the horsepower. Yes. And uh, the N3N and the Stearman, uh, flew at 90 miles an hour, and what does this one perform at? This will cruise about 170 miles per hour. Uh, its maximum straight and level speed is between 212 and 220, depending on, on the age and condition of the aircraft. Okay, let's start with the takeoff roll. You start the engine, you taxi out onto the runway, and uh, how long would the takeoff roll be? Approximately. Full, at sea level, about 450 feet, 500 feet. And at what speed would you rotate? About 80 knots. And you would climb out at? At 110 knots. And you would cruise at? About 137 to 140 knots. And at that speed, uh, how much fuel would it drink an hour? At 2250 RPMs and uh, 20, let's see, 2250 and 2700, 27 inches, we're doing about 35 gallons per hour. At aerobatics, we're, using, we're doing 55 gallons an hour. 35 gallons an hour? That's just about minimum, yes. Yeah. Uh, how, how much fuel does it carry? It carries 110 gallons, the equivalent of two 255-gallon uh, two drums. So you could fly for how long on a load of gas? About three hours if you were, wanted to stretch it. I, I have a two-hour tank myself, so that's all the further I go. Now, uh, could you throttle back and reduce the fuel consumption? It's not good on the engine. It's a supercharged engine, and they say the pistons have a tendency to rattle back and forth if you don't keep, keep them loaded with Is enough cylinder right? pressure. 
Well, in my airplane, I can throttle back and fly slower and use less gas, but you don't have that option in this airplane. People do it. People will throttle back to 30 gallons, and they've told me, I've had old timers tell me they got 26 uh, gallons, you know, out of it, but, yeah, but I don't like to do this. Yeah, but destroy a $20,000 engine. It's faulty economy. Yeah. So uh, I, I basically have it mostly up at the 55-gallon uh, hour because I'm flying either aerobatics or formation. Uh, you use 8087? No, I use 100 octane. 100 low lead. It's a supercharged engine, so I, I believe it should have the, the higher octane rate. And that's something like 225, 250 a gallon. So you're talking about a lot of money just to fly this airplane. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, does it was 55 gallon? It was 55 cents a gallon when I purchased the aircraft. So mm -hmm. it seemed to be a real doable thing. It, it was. It, uh, it changed rapidly. There. First time I flew, gasoline was five gallons for a dollar, 19.9 a gallon. Wow. Uh, it that the tax is more than 19 cents a gallon now. Um, I was going to ask you about the gasoline. Uh, you use 100 low lead. Do you have trouble getting that at different airports, or is it readily the, available? Pretty much the standard uh, octane rating around most of the airports. It's it's the 8087, I believe, that the other antiquers have problems finding. Mm -hmm. uh, what would this stall at? Uh, mine indicated in the front is, is uh, 60 knots in the front, and, and it's indicated in the back at 55. So I have to, when I go from the front seat to the back seat, I have to remember that it's it's because of the two different gauges. And when when how does it break when you do a spin? It breaks rapidly. I mean, it's a it's a quick snapping aircraft. Sure. You're right on your back right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's not difficult to recover from. You just have to do it instantaneously, and you can't stay in your recovery mode, or you'll spin to the opposite direction. Oh, is that right? Yes, it was the uh, it's. Um, it was probably one of the aircraft that killed a lot of student pilots during the war going from base to final. They would put too much rudder in and thing would snap over in its back. So it keeps you awake and it makes you, you know, realize you're in a, in a plane that, that could kill you if, if, if you're not careful. So. so you not only have to be a tap dancer on the pedals on the ground, but you have to be uh, awake. You just have to be flying. awake and aware, yes, mm -hmm. when you're in the pattern and when you're doing aerobatics too. Now, this was a trainer for thousands of pilots in World War II. Yes, it was. And after the war, too, it's the South African Air Force just got rid of their Harvards about five years ago. Oh, is that they right? Kept them that Still long. using them. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, after they flew this airplane, did, did most of the pilots uh, go into bombers, or what did they fly next? Well, they, they went either direction, depending on their height, their weight, their aptitudes. Uh, they would either go into the, the twin-engine trainers, the UC-78s and the AT-10s, uh, which was the Beach and, and the Cessna Bobcat, or they would, they would go off into uh, single-engine pursuit aircraft. And if, if they had elected or had been uh, assigned to the twin engine trainers, then they would go off into the bombers, twin and multi-engine bombers. We did a program with a guy who flew up in the Aleutians when the Japanese invaded Alaska in World War II. And he said he went from an AT-6 to a Vaulty Vibrator uh, and then into bombers up there. It seems like that's the backward way of going. Is that getting, right? Because the, the Volte was a fixed gear aircraft of 450 horsepower or 440, depending which aircraft you flew. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, it was less difficult to fly. So a lot of them were used for instrument traders. Um, Maybe that's what it was. They were getting him ready for bombers. Yes. Because he went to the Aleutians, and he said that uh, it was zero zero almost every day. Uh, that was most likely the reason. So that. every reason or every flight uh, was an instrument flight. Well, what else would you like to tell us about this airplane? Its performance or uh, power? Or? I'd just say it's it's just a real joy to have. I it's. I, I never have many problems with it. It's uh, I just it's the best airplane I've ever owned. I I always wanted to have a Mustang, but I got into this and I and I appreciated it so much. I'm glad I have it. I, that's why I've never sold it. I, uh, we had a four plane formation group uh, for many years. I guess you knew Billy Spear and David Blackburn and Addison Pemberton. We used to do air shows together and and flying this airplane in formation was was a real joy as well. I, I have many 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 good memories from it. What kind of a TBO would the engine have? How many hours before you have to overhaul it or replace it? Well, some crop duster had gotten hold of my aircraft and uh, flew the heck out of the engine, hung it back on there, and never never wrote down the time on it. So I don't know what I had when I finally had this thing overhauled. I think I had it written down. I had 1,500 hours, but I'm sure it was many more. Uh, that's about, I'd say that's about right for about 1,500 hours. A 1,500 hour right. engine? Yeah. And uh, do you do a, a complete major overhaul at 1,500? I did. I sent it up to Aero Engines. And you can't do a top on this, can you? Because it's a rotary engine. 
It's a radial engine. A, a radial engine. Yes. Yeah, a radial engine. Yeah. So um, you can't do a top on a radial engine. Yes, you can. You can? Yeah. You just pull the jugs off and do your cylinders and your, and your valves and stuff. You could, you could do it. Okay. But did, have, have you done a major overhaul on it? This has had a major about 60 hours ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it's, it's a fresh major? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was probably cost me uh, a wife, <laughs> but I had the, half the engine. I thought you were going to say an arm and a leg. You know, I know that. I, it, I had half the engine in my backyard uh, doing sandblasting and doing all the tubes and doing all the pieces and cleaning everything up, and it just went on forever. It was a forever project. And Eddie Maslin across the field helped me hang the engine and get it going again. Aero Engines did the overhaul, and they did a magnificent job. It was it was something to see. It was, it, it was like a butcher shop. You took the aircraft up there, or took the engine up there, and these all these people attacked it, and it had it disassembled in 15 minutes and they would show you all the parts. Is that right? It, it, was, it was amazing. Well, I, they knew what they were doing. But I was, yeah. I, I, was, I was overwhelmed. I mean, I couldn't believe that they would just take this in there and it, and it was like having a cow and they just shredded it and it had every component available and looked at the crankshaft, looked at the camshaft and, and nothing passed and nothing got put back of that engine unless it was perfect. I was amazed. It, cost an arm and a leg, but, yeah. but it, it's, I believe it's a very safe engine now. It, it's like putting plaster on the ceiling. If I tried to do it, it would fall down exactly. in my face. Exactly, and these other fellows, they just <laughs> they put it on like nobody's business. Yeah. We'll be back right after this important message. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Captain Fred's Aviation Theater. Today we're visiting with Mike McRae and his SNJ AT6 Harvard airplane. But for him, it's an SNJ because it's painted in navy colors. Uh, Mike, we want to talk a little bit about uh, you and your flying, but uh, we can't do that without first talking about your parents because they were both pilots. Would you tell our viewers about your father, please? My father was an enlisted uh man on the aircraft carrier Saratoga. He was a radioman and gunner in the backseat of an SB SB2C dive bomber. Uh, he told me he never felt safe in that aircraft and he wrote a letter to his congressman and said he wanted to fly them. So the, the congressman all it and they sent him to Pensacola as an enlisted pilot. And from there he was transferred to the Mediterranean in PBY seaplanes for anti-submarine and uh, anti-ship warfare. The PBY is a famous airplane. It, it is indeed. It, it was the one that discovered the enemy at, at the Battle of, uh, of uh, Midway. Um, it's it's a very slow aircraft, though. It's only about 110 miles an hour, I believe. Well, but it was for submarine patrol and a That's variety correct. of other specialized tasks yes. that it was especially designed for. Yes. So uh, they, they had a lot of enlisted uh, PBY pilots. That's Tell correct. our viewers about the Black Cat Squadron. The Black Cats, I believe, were, the aircraft were painted black. They did nighttime warfare against shipping and submarines, and submarines would come to the surface at nighttime. They carried what they called ash cans, which were uh, actually death charges, and they carried sometimes a 500-pound bomb on the wing. They were equipped with 30-caliber uh, machine guns, but they were very slow and they were very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, they they had some enlisted uh, Medal of Honor and Distinguished Flying Cross pilots in World War II. Quite a few, I believe, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, then your uh, mother uh, was a nurse. She took her training here at Mercy Hospital in San Diego. That's correct. And uh, she became a pilot. Tell yes. our viewers about your mother. Uh, my mom learned to fly in the early days of uh, aviation here in San Diego at Spears Aircraft or Spears Field in San Diego, which is located where the Loma Portal Shopping Center is now. Arnett Spear was the owner of the, of the airfield. Uh, now, the Loma Portal Shopping Center would be. Uh, about where the world's longest traffic light is. Yes, about Midway and Rosecrans was mm -hmm. the area there. The, uh, and that was an airport at one time. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Uh, she soloed in a uh, in a Piper Cub that had a three-cylinder radial engine, and I think it was called a Zeekly engine. And um, a three-cylinder. Yes. A very, they were kind of rare. I've never seen another one. I don't think I've even seen a picture of one, but she told me about it. Probably 24 horsepower. <laughs> That's right, something like that. She uh, was, I guess she had the notoriety of being the last aircraft in the air in San Diego on December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. She, she was in the air. She was in the air over San Diego here. And when she landed, the, the notice had come out. Everybody knew about it. And they, they uh, took all the civil aircraft. They took the wings off of them, put on flat cars, and shipped them to Arizona. They weren't, there was no civil aviation was allowed on the West Coast in those days. 
Because we were vulnerable. That's that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, she then heard that Jackie Cochran was was forming a group of women pilots uh, in the Army Air Corps under. Now Jackie Cochran was a famous race pilot. Yes, she was. Yes. Uh, she was friends with Hap Arnold, who was our commander in chief, I think, of the uh, Army Air Corps, and she and and uh, uh, General Arnold proposed having women as civil pilots to test, fly, and to uh, uh, ferry military aircraft during World War II. This was in order to free the men up for combat training. In those days, fighting. there were no slackers. Everybody wanted to do their part. That's right. Yeah. She was accepted uh, to Sweetwater, Texas for her training, and she was originally in class 1943-4. She became ill at the time, went home, and then went back to uh, Jackie, accepted her again in the class of 1944-3. And she went back and graduated? She did. She graduated. From there, she went to Stockton, California, where she got a tra multi-engine training in UC-78s, which was a, we call the bamboo bomber, bomber and the AT-10s, which was the, uh, the beach twin engine aircraft. She was then placed in a B-26 aircraft, where she became a target tow operator. That was at Kingman, Arizona? At Kingman, Arizona. That's mm -hmm. correct. She told me that uh, she used to fly up and down the Colorado River towing targets. Yes, she Tell did. our viewers a little bit about that. Well, she would take off from Kingman, the little fellow on the back would reel a, a windsock type of apparatus out the back. It was made of canvas, and she would fly at 35,000 feet for the waist gunners to shoot at her from the B-17s. Not uh, at her, at the target. Well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. Sometimes they would get bullet holes in, in the tail, and, and uh, you always knew who it was because the bullets would have a little ring of color around each one of them, so you knew which gunner was shooting at you. Um, she would then do drop down to low altitude at Blythe, California, and they would drop the sock off there and return to Kingman for the next day. And then after the war, uh, she was active in the 99s. Yes, she was. She, I, I believe she was one of the original 99s in uh, San Diego County. Uh, she helped to form, I believe, the, uh, the East County El Cajon chapter. The El Cajon Valley chapter. As well chapter. as the Mission, Mission Bay Mission chapter. Mission Bay chapter. Right, that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, she passed away two, two and a half years ago. I, I've seen a picture of her in the White House with Pat Nixon. Yes. Uh, she was active in the Powder Puff Derby. Yes, she was. She flew 13 Powder Puff Derbies and multiple other small uh, women's air races. Okay. Well, with that background and that heritage, uh, it's just natural that you became a pilot. Would you tell us about that? Well, as I grew up, I had nothing but aviation memorabilia around me, and I loved airplanes, but uh, my family was also involved in medicine. Uh, I, I decided to become a podiatrist, and I went away to college for 10 years. A podiatrist is? It's a foot doctor. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, doctor who specializes in in the foot. That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, it wasn't until after I, ca I came home in 1974 to practice, and it wasn't until 1976 that I started taking flying lessons again. In what? In uh, just a Cessna 150s. I'd taken one one lesson previously. Mother bought it for me for my 16th birthday. I got a, a lesson in a, in a 140 Cessna right here at Gillespie Field, but I never had any. A Cessna 140. That's correct. That's a tail dragger, yes. high wing, mm -hmm. two place side by side. Mm -hmm. A fellow named Bob Sanders was my instructor, and he lived right here on the edge of the field, and I, I can see his hangar from here, and it's got Sanders Aviation written right on the side of it. Uh, he passed away many years later. He was the official starter of the Powder Puff Derbies. Oh, was he? he was. His wife, uh, Dottie Sanders, was an instructor and involved in the Powder Puff Derby, too. Yes, a very nice lady. And uh, so you took your lessons in the plane that replaced the Cessna 140, the Cessna 150. Right. Uh, and you soloed and got your license in a Cessna 150? That's correct. And then what? Well, a week after I got my license, I went down to Brownfield and found a fellow named Ralph Buck there that that was instructing in a little 7AC Aronka Champ. It was, I wanted to fly these tail-wheeled aircraft, and, and I wanted, uh, it was just something. That was, was he at Flying J? Yes, he was. They had champs for years. They yes. specialized in champs. This was the last one they had left, and it was 3370 Echo was its number. And I loved that airplane. I, the James Brothers Flying J at yes, Brownfield. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. So you bought it? No, I just learned to fly oh, in it. Oh, you learned to fly and in it. I, and I had, all my friends went down and learned to fly in it, too. My girlfriend learned to fly in it. My, my, I had about four friends that went down there that took lessons in it, and it's still flying. I have no idea how it's still flying, but it is. Yeah. And from there, what did you do? Well, I, I didn't know where to go. I, I didn't know what I was interested in until one day our flying club, the Skyliners, 
went up to Ramona and one of the members, Elmer Barney, was giving rides in a Starduster II, which is a, a little sport biplane, open cockpit. Uh, High performance. Yes, it was, a, it was the finest looking thing I'd ever seen in my life. I fell in love with it and, and uh, you have to be careful what you want because someday it might be yours and Elmer ended up selling me half interest in it and, uh, and that was the easy part. The next part was well, how was I going to learn to fly this thing. And so I got a hold of a fellow on the, on the field here named Ronnie Martin who went out and uh, gave me lessons in it and God bless him, he, he, he hung in there with me and finally got me to solo the aircraft. It, it was probably the hardest plane I ever learned how to fly. Now you've had several other airplanes, what was the next one? Well. Actually, the next airplane after that I owned was this plane here. But didn't you learn to fly in a, a Mustang or something like well, that? Well, that was the road to this. I, mm -hmm. w after I, I had some tail dragger experience, I decided, gosh, you know, I, I'd love to fly a P-51. And so I didn't know how I was going to do it. And I started looking through Air Classics magazine and found an advertisement for a fellow up in King City named Gordon Plaskett. And it says, learn to fly the Mustang. So it, he had a, a Stearman and, a, and an AT-6 and a dual control Mustang from the Korean War era and he let me fly his airplanes. I took every penny I had in the world and threw it at this man, and he, he, he uh, did his job. He, then how did you get this airplane here? Well, this was sitting on a field that was pretty beat up looking. It was an old yellow ugly thing with oil stains everywhere. And he says, he said, son, why don't you take this plane home with you? And I said, I can't, I can't afford another airplane. I have a Starduster too. And he says, sure you can. He says, you just talk to your banker about it. So I went into the U.S. National Bank in Lemon Grove, and a fellow named Bill Allen, who was the president, he happened to be an ex-Navy pilot, an instructor in SNJs. He said, well, sure, you can have this airplane because if you don't make the payments, I get it, he said. So he, <laughs> he uh, dumped the extra added burden of another payment on me, and I went up and took the plane home. And if people would like to meet you or see your airplane, they can come out here at 1 p.m. the first Sunday of every month at the administration building at Gillespie Field and you have it on exhibit. That's correct. That's the first Sunday of every month, 1 p.m., at the administration building at Gillespie Field. You can meet Mike McRae, as Jimmy Durante would say, in person, and you can see his SNJ airplane. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Fred. I appreciate it. As always, this is Captain Fred saying, I love airplanes, and I honor the people who fly them. And that includes the AT-6 SNJ Harvard.